This is Section 4.8, Applications to Business and Economics. Our first objective is to understand the vocabulary of economics in both verbal and geometric or graphical terms. When you're done, I'd like you to be able to explain the difference between average cost and marginal cost. This section has a lot of vocabulary in it, but you'll notice that there's some overlap between the vocabulary that you have in your economics class and some of the vocabulary that is used repeatedly, some of the adjectives used over and over. So the first one is average cost function. If capital C of X is the cost function, then we can represent the total cost when X items are produced using this capital C of X. And the average cost function, which is little c of X, will be the total cost divided by the number of items that have been produced. So this is an old idea about how we get averages. We add up the cost of all of them and then we divide by how many there are. So this will represent the cost per unit when X units have been produced. Next we have what's called marginal cost and this word marginal in the context of your calculus class will be the derivative. So if capital C of X is the cost function then the marginal cost will be the derivative of that C with respect to X. So let's suppose a company wishes to minimize its average cost. Using calculus we can take the derivative of this average cost function and do low D high there's our low d high minus the high d low, so there's the high d low over low squared. Now since extreme values occur at critical points or endpoints in the domain, we can determine when little c prime equals zero by looking at when the top equals zero. It will never be undefined because we can't divide by zero up in the original. So zero is not in the domain. That means our only critical points will come from the top. If I set the top equal to zero and rearrange this, we can see that c prime will be the same as capital C over little x. In other words, the marginal cost is going to equal the average cost. And that's something you might have learned in your economics course already. If the average cost is minimized, then when that occurs, the marginal cost is going to equal the average cost. If you graph the average cost and you graph the marginal cost, where they intersect will be at the minimum average cost. Next we have a demand function or a price function and that is denoted as little p of x and it is the price per unit that a company can charge if it wishes to sell x units. Now for me this was a little bit of a flip from how I was accustomed to thinking about price. I always thought that it was price that determined how many you sold and so I often would treat price as the independent variable and then the number of items that I could sell would become the dependent variable. But this is incorrect. In the economics world we decide ahead of time how many items we wish to sell and then based on that we determine the price. So the independent variable is how many items you're selling and the price will depend upon that X. Therefore, if you want to sell a whole lot of them, then the price you can charge has to be low. In other words, the function is going to be a decreasing function. The more you want to sell, the lower the price you're going to charge. Next we have revenue or sales. The revenue is the money that comes in. It's kind of your cash register receipts at the end of the day. So if you have sold X units in the day and you charged P of X for each one of those units, then the revenue that comes in will be the number you sold times the price you charged. Again, that word marginal here is going to mean the derivative. So marginal revenue will be the derivative of this revenue function. Last, we have the profit function and the marginal profit. Well, profit is the money that we make. So it's the money that has come in, which is the revenue, minus the cost that was required to produce the items and stock them. So our total profit will be revenue minus cost. And if we want the marginal profit function, we're going to take the derivative of this and get our prime minus C prime. So again, let's say instead of minimizing average cost, that we want to maximize profit. Using calculus, we'd take the derivative of that profit curve and get R prime minus C prime 
and then we'd set it equal to zero or undefined. It will be zero when marginal revenue equals marginal cost. Again, we can think of that graphically. If I graph my revenue here in the red and my cost here in the blue, we can see that they're the furthest away from each other. In other words, the difference between revenue and cost is the largest when those two slopes are the same. Let's look at example one. The average cost of producing x units of a commodity is given by this little c of x. I want to find the marginal cost at a production level of a thousand units and then in practical terms explain what that means. To do that, we first have to figure out what the cost is. Since we have the average cost, which is little c of x, that was the total cost divided by x. So if I want to figure out the total cost so that I can take its derivative, I need to multiply little c times x. Well, if I multiply little c times x, I will get a total cost of 21.4x minus 0.002x squared. Once I have that, I can find the marginal cost, which is the derivative of this, and that will be 21.4 minus 0.004x. I'm interested in knowing the marginal cost at a thousand units. So if I plug in a thousand, I get 21.4 minus 4, which ends up being 17.4. Let's think about the units. Cost is measured in dollars, and the input is measured in units. So graphically, on my cost function, I've gone to a thousand units, and I've computed the slope. That means I will have dollars per unit. Now if we think about what this means in the context of the problem, we have a slope. It says if we go over 1, then we're going to go up 17.4. So what this marginal cost tells us is it says how much more it will cost if I produce one more item. So if I've already produced a thousand, it will cost about seventeen point four dollars more to produce the hundred and first, or excuse me, one thousand and first item. Notice that that's not the exact cost change. The exact cost change would be from this point up to the y coordinate on the cost curve, but that marginal cost is a very good estimate. For part b, we want to find the average cost and the marginal cost given the total cost. So this is asking us for two different things. The average cost will be the total cost divided by x. So in this case, it would be 3700 over x plus 5 minus 4 hundredths times x plus 3 ten thousandths x squared. If, on the other hand, I want the marginal cost, that's the derivative of the original cost function. That will just be a 5 minus 8 hundredths x plus 9 ten thousandths x squared. Lastly, part c, I want to find the marginal profit. So to find the marginal profit, that's just asking me to find the derivative of the profit. Well, I can't get the derivative of the profit until I've actually written the profit function. Recall that the profit is the money that comes in minus the money that goes out. So it will be the revenue or the number of items I've sold times the price I'm charging per item minus the cost function. Now one of the big mistakes that people make when they're computing these profit functions is they neglect to subtract the entire cost. So make sure you put parentheses around the whole cost function. If we do that, we get the profit function is a negative one hundredth x squared plus an eight x minus a six hundred and eighty. Now I'm prepared to take the derivative so that I can find my marginal profit, and it will be negative 0.02x plus 8. With example 2 now, we want to determine the production level that will maximize the profit. So what we're going to do is we're going to first figure out a profit function, because we can't maximize things until we have what we want to maximize written down in terms of a single variable. Remember that profit is revenue minus cost. So that will be the number of items I'm selling times the amount I'm charging 
per item minus the entire cost function. Now in this particular case, I'm going to use the calculator to help me just to make sure I don't make any stupid mistakes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put y1 to be x times that little p of x and I'm going to let y2 be the cost function and then I'm going to let y3 be y1 minus y2. Once I have y1 minus y2 in y3, then I can let y4 be the derivative of that profit function. Now remember that I want a max, so that means I need this y4 to cross the x-axis from positive to negative. So let's take a minute and look at our calculators and get everything in. So in here in my y1, I have my x times my demand function. In y2, I've put my cost function. y3 is y1 minus y2, and y4 is the derivative. We've got to remember that we can't make negative items. So we'll go to the window and start with 0 and go maybe to, I don't know, 250. And let's just do a zoom fit and see what happens. Now it's probably going to take a while to graph, so while it's graphing we'll think about what we want to write down over here. We want to maximize the profit. If this were a free response problem, I would need to actually take the derivative. So to take the derivative, I'm going to multiply this out and then differentiate. So I'll have an x times a 3.5, the derivative of that is a 3.5. Here I'd have an x squared times a negative 0.01, so that derivative would be a negative 0.02x, and then I'll subtract the derivative of all this, so 1.26 minus 0.02x plus 0.12321x squared. So here's my p prime of x. I need this to equal 0 or undefined. We know it'll never equal undefined because there's no problems with this, no division, no even roots, no logs, and it'll be 0 at the location that we find on our calculator. And then we would write p has a max at x equals something because p is continuous and p prime changes from positive to negative. So here it has been long enough now for our calculator to have found the graph of that derivative. So let's look here. And we could do an F5 math and find the 0. And here we can see that it occurs at 103.279. So we could round that up to 280. Now one thing that's a little tricky about these types of problems is that we cannot make 0 0.280 portions of an item. We either make 103 items or we make 104 items. And we cannot assume that by rounding to the nearest we're going to get the value that actually maximizes the profit. So we need to test both 103 items and 104 items so that we can locate the actual max that we're going to get. So to do that, remember we put the profit into y3, so on the home screen we can do y3 of 103, and we can do y3 of 104. Notice that the max actually in this case does happen. Here we get one penny more with 103 items than we did at 104. So this was 70.23 and 70.22. So this one is the max.